You are now listening to FemRegard Podcast with Tessa Markle and Carolina Alvarez. Mm, fem. Hey, Fem fam. It's Carolina and Tessa. Um, we are coming to you with our last episode of season 13 today. <gasps> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> I know that doesn't mean like a ton for you guys because we pretty much just continually keep putting them out. But for us, it's like a milestone. Like we're over 130 episodes now. Like, oh my gosh, (laughs) it's hard to believe. Girl, it's hard to believe. But without, but what a way to end the season with the guest we have on today. Can we just say super fangirl moment over here (laughs) from my end? (laughs) Tessa, who are we having on? (laughs) Let's see, how did we first, I believe her PR reached out to us first to promote the film that she's in, which is All My Puny Sorrows. And our guest today is Sarah Gadon. Um, She has been acting since she was a kiddo. She is Canadian Mm -hmm. and she's been in a lot of things that we really love, like Black Bear, which is one of our favorite like recent thrillers. She's been in True Detective. She's been in Leonard Kenny. She's been in like a million things that are just really great shows and movies. Um, And in this film, All My Puny Sorrows, which was based on a novel, which we'll get into because she really got to work closely with the writer as well. Um, She plays a suicidal sister to Alison Pill, who is the other main actor in this. And it's really a journey of, you know, she is doing everything to end her life to get that wish that she wants and her sister is doing everything to keep that from happening and it's just such an emotional journey and such a good film and like you can tell so much is going on under the surface for these characters so we really Mm -hmm. got to get into it with Sarah about like how she was able to tap into that how she was able to like you know, ex- exclude everything else going on on set and really just hone in on that. And as actors, we really enjoyed this episode because I know we had some takeaways. Like there's stuff that I want to try next time I have, you know, a juicy role yeah. like this and, and am on set. So yeah, talking to her was super inspirational today. I really enjoyed it. Super inspirational. And for directors too. I mean, having Judith Weston on our show, it's always like that two-way streak. So I'm sure our directors will have great takeaways on how to maybe better utilize the rehearsal mm-hmm. period, things like this. So it was just so fun to like dive into that process with Sarah today. And she's stunning. She's so well-versed and intelligent. You guys will love, love this episode and have just a wonderful insight on this whole process and, and go see this film. Yeah. yeah when this episode is out, um, it will already be available on demand and digital, but just to put it out there, it, it has come out on May 3rd of 2022. So definitely go ahead and uh, rent it, watch it right after you listen to yes, this. Yes, that's All My Puny Sorrows and today's episode with Sarah Gadot. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for coming on today. We were very excited to talk to you because we've both seen you in a lot of things. <laughs> we were just looking at your IMDb. Um, big fans of Black Bear. I'm a huge Letterkenny fan. Uh, True Detective. Like so many things. So we were really excited to talk to you today. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Good, good. Yeah. No, I I was dying. Like right when I saw your name and Black Bear, I was like, we have to get her on this show. <laughs> That your performance in that and just obviously Audrey Plaza and that just incredible. And I love thrillers. We both are thriller fans. So that was just my, of 2020, my favorite thriller I've seen of all year. So I just was like so excited and excited to see you in this role, which was we'll get to um, because I feel like very challenging, (laughs) very like we'll get into that. Um, but also just putting it out here, Tessa, she's trying to make leaps to Canada. And every time we have someone on the pod who does work there, I'm like, no, (laughs) we are, we are like, well, but we do want to get into that today. So just try not to oversell it because I need my girl here in LA with me, but, (laughs) 
Um, yeah, we want, we just want to get into the background a little yeah. bit of your acting career and, and, you know, for listeners, she's can Canadian based and, and yeah, you've been acting since there. you were little too. I, I yeah. would love to hear about that. Like what it was like to start so young and how that has progressed your career. So, yeah. Sure, yeah. I mean, the beginning of my journey, is kind of interesting because it parallels Allison's journey as well, who is my co-star in All My Puny Sorrows, Allison Pill, the great mm -hmm. Allison Pill. Um, I know, I love mm -hmm. her too. <laughs> we, we both went to a school in Toronto called Claude Watson School for the Performing Arts. It's a performing arts school. So half, half of the day you spend fast tracking your academics and then the other half of the day you spend rotating an arts curriculum of visual arts, drama, dance, and music. And so... We both got into this school. Um, you go in grade four when you're eight years old, eight or nine. And um, wow. and we did that all the way up until grade eight. And wow. we both also started acting as kids um, in Toronto. So we've known each other for a really long time. And we were both in these kind of really intensive arts education programs, which really, I think, formed who we were as people and then also as artists. And then we, we went on to the same high school, uh, which was uh, an alternative school called Interact in Vaughn Road Academy. Um, it was like a school for kids who had uh, basically jobs. No, I'm joking. It was like <laughs> for kids who had extracurriculars that were really intense and needed independent study. So lots of athletes, actors, dancers went to that school. Um, so we had this very like similar educational trajectory um, together. And then we went our separate ways as adults working, you know, in different places. And she moved to New York right away. And so it was really interesting to kind of like meet up with her like at the beginning of the pandemic when I found out she was doing the film and we both like drove to Northern Ontario um, to this place called North Bay. And it was so weird to like see her in this like frozen <laughs> again and be like, whoa, like, how are you? She brought her kids. She's like an amazing mom. And Aww. to kind of catch up at this like really bizarre moment in time was really cool. Right. That's really awesome. So uh, for our listeners, they play sisters in the film, and it just sounds like you have this lovely sister-like backstory from your upbringing. Yeah. That also is so interesting. Like, it parallels in your film, too. Yeah, I think. and we're, we, it really felt like we were cut from the same cloth, you know? When you, in those yeah. kinds of, like, intensive environments, um, it really, it's just so it's so formative, you know, and we have this shared history, you know, and being a child actor is an intense experience also. And to like have that, that's like similar experiences, but also like in this tied to the same location, like growing up in Toronto and like acting here and yeah. knowing like similar experiences with like casting directors or projects, right? you know, it's just really was kind of amazing to have that foundation. And the film is very, it's very intense. The subject matter is very intense. And so to be able to approach that material with somebody that you have this kind of like built in trust and loyalty to right. was really unique. Yeah. I think that would be such an amazing experience as an actor because mm -hmm. it's like the chemistry is already there, <laughs> you know? Well, because, you know, when you grow up with someone, you know, Allison is a few years older than me. And so she was always a little bit ahead of me in school. And I always really admired her. And as an actor, like I, I always really admired her and her ability. And then to kind of see her now as this, as this, you know, incredible actor, she has this wonderful career, amazing work under her belt. And then she's also a mom and she's like an incredible mom. And her daughter was there with us. And her mom came up from Toronto to be there also. My mom came up also too. And we were all kind of like together. It was all Women. Mm -hmm. And it was just really cool to see her in this totally different stage of her life also. Yeah, that's so fun. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get into All My Peony Sorrows a little bit more. How did you come to this? Like, you know, was it just, it, was it a role that was offered to you? Was it an audition that came up? Like, how did this even begin this journey with this film? Yeah, so I knew, I knew Mike McGowan, our director, and I had read the book 
before, you know, Miriam's such a celebrated author and she, I've, I've just been a fan of her writing for a long time. And so Mike kind of came to me a few years ago and he said he was adapting the novel and I read a version of the script and we talked a bit about it, but I don't think he was ready for the film to kind of come together yet. And then uh, mm -hmm. a few years later, uh, it was 2020, we were in the middle of the pandemic and the film came together and he said, I'm going to make this movie in North Bay. Allison's going to play Yoli. Do you want to play Elf? And I, I was just kind of like, oh my God, like Allison's on board. Yeah, like <laughs> 20 minutes. Um, and I wanted to, you know, I really wanted to do the film. And it just came at a time where 2020 was such an intense year for everybody. It was filled with like so much change and loss and intensity. I don't really think anybody's life is the same as it was at the beginning of 2020. Yeah. It was also a time where, you know, we hadn't really developed the vaccines. So working and shooting was also felt like this big risk, like, oh my God, we're gonna make this yeah. movie. And, and not, not you know, to, be, to sound like too dramatic, like, oh, well, you could die making this movie, but it was like, you know, we, it was still a period of such, you know, unknown and fear. And it was, it felt like a real risk to like go to work. So, absolutely. and then also yeah. as an indie film, you know, we shot the movie in four weeks. Um, there was no like contingency plan if somebody got sick. So mm -hmm. if the movie, you know, if someone got COVID and the movie got shut down, like that was, that was it, you know? So it was a really yeah. intense time and it felt really meaningful to tell this story about, you know, loss, uh, you know, intergenerational trauma, family, exploring this relationship uh, between these two sisters um, with someone that I really cared about, like Allison, it just felt like everything kind of aligned. And I was like, yeah, let's go, let's go to the North and make this movie. So. Yeah, that's really awesome. I feel like it, it, you know, it was just such an emotionally driven time. Uh, like you said, nobody's lives are the same since COVID, but the filmmakers right. that we've talked to that have worked during that time, it's like, it's always like an intense emotional journey and it all just came together exactly how it was supposed to, you know? So it's just, it's kind of cool to hear that, you know, those stories. Yeah. And I think also just even like, what is, what is it going to take for you to want to leave your little safe house and go and actually risk right. yourself to, to tell a story. And this really felt worthy of that. Yeah. And you, you right. guys had filmed very quickly, right? I mean, it was less than yeah, a month. Yeah, I was just going to say that. It was, yeah, like, you wrapped on December 16th, I have in my yeah. months. You started it in December. So, girl, <laughs> like, what is that? <laughs> what is that like? You were you, I, that's just always so impressive. And we as indie filmmakers and our, our audience are heavily in, involved in independent filmmaking. So it's just so inspiring like you can do it you can hustle you can you know get it done and it doesn't need to be like this in like feel like this it's always a large project but like so done in six months and you know you're still filming and still filming I just I love that indie filmmaker like we get it done in a couple weeks and this beautiful thing happens if that makes sense it, it can feel like that sometimes is impossible totally I mean I feel like, you know, all independent film is so fly by the seat of your pants. You're always under yeah. the gun. You're always pressed for time. Resources are scarce. And that's just the way that independent films are made. Um, but I think with something like this and yeah, and I think just because the way that things have been so compressed in the indie space, you don't have a lot of time on set to figure things out. So rehearsal becomes so important and such an important piece of the puzzle for films that are emotionally complex. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Allison and I are really big like fans and advocates of rehearsal. Um, you know, I so want to rehearse. <laughs> so are we, no, that's really great to hear. This is like really Yeah, I want to rehearse yeah. as much as I can. And I think that people who have been maybe burned by the rehearsal process or don't really understand what it is you know, are really missing out on like a way, like a free way to make your movie so much better. Yeah. Um, and, and actually Mike, our director, Mike McGowan, 
you know, when we went up there, I was like, we have to, we've got to dig into this material. We have to, you know, work it. And right. Allison and I have to spend time together. And we, you know, and he was like, yeah, Allison wants to do that too. And I don't really do a lot of rehearsals. So why don't you guys, you know, take hold of that? And so we really did. And we really used it as an opportunity to like massage the material and to work the material and to really like, mm -hmm start to lay down the emotional pathways of what was going on between these two sisters and what the scenes were really about. And, and I think that people who are afraid of rehearsal, I think it's because they feel like it should be result oriented, you know, mm -hmm. like they think that, oh, if you're rehearsing, you need to get to a certain place, or I want to see something uh -huh. in a rehearsal. But for me and for Allison, that's like the antithesis of what rehearsal is. Like rehearsal is a time to ask questions, to um, learn how the people that you're working with communicate, how they listen, mm -hmm. how mm -hmm. they talk to you. It's a time for you to ask all the questions that you have. And as an, for me as an artist, I find like my process is very intellectual at first. Like I need to really understand from a rational place, like why is this person doing these things? Why is this woman saying these things in order for me mm -hmm. to trust the material enough to like start to really lay down the emotion on top of that so that when I get to set you know everything is just breathing and working through intuitive movement and impulse and trying to just stay present and all of the thinking yeah. and like emotional work is done well before I get to set so yeah. Allison is very similar like that too and so we really just worked over the material a lot because we knew we didn't have a lot of time when we got to set to, to ask those questions. Right. I think a lot of times too, another reason why actors or directors veer from that is maybe over uh, rehearsing and feeling like the material will be stale or just it'll come out flat. But I love in the terms that you've laid it out is just it's not really about again like hitting a goal or, or just making that scene perfect and landing it but creating this connection and, and exploration period um because I think that's why that's another reason why I think even myself like I don't want to over rehearse anything if that yeah makes sense. but I think you know when you're sitting down and you're not in your environment and you're not in wardrobe yeah. and you're not in your hair and makeup and you're you're just talking through material you're t you begin to kind of touch on emotion mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. it's really important to be able to feel like you can touch on the, on those feelings like you can sit inside those feelings in a scene and then you start to kind of yeah. realize through that process that like really like we're all kind of these channels where these like open channels and a million feelings and thoughts kind of flow through us at any given moment in time. And when you rehearse, you start to kind of like lay down the pathways for those triggers to happen. So that when you hear a word or when you see someone do something, it's like all of these things start to happen and flare up so that when you get to set, you're not sitting there thinking like, I don't feel anything, you know, or yeah. I don't. Yeah, so understand. true. No, that's so true. Yeah. And like, especially with um, your, your role in this, like you really need to, there's a, you had a beautiful stillness in a lot of it and sadness that you can tell, like, that was your channel. Like you were having all that emotion because your character was a lot of the times very still in, in her feelings and her movement, but it was very strong. Like, coming forward so I feel like you can't just do that <laughs> without knowing all the different you can't fake it you have to know all the different layers as to like you know to do it well to really make us feel something in return you have to like do all that work and that makes so much sense like the rehearsal period is so important. I think it's also a part of feeling safe enough when you get to set to inhabit vulnerable spaces and I think that Sometimes directors don't necessarily realize that that's what's so great about rehearsals for actors is that you want to go in trusting your director and trusting that you're telling the same story and trusting that the character is on the same space, same page, because the, the, the last thing you want, I think, is to go to set and start trying to push someone into something that they're like, no, I don't want to go there. I don't feel ready for that. I don't feel comfortable for that. And yeah. I think that that's a big part of like creating that bond and trust 
when you're a- asking people to go to places that are really vulnerable. Yeah. 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 That's very true. I mean, this is, you know, the only profession where you're literally just asking people to bear their entire souls to you yeah. within sometimes just, you know, the same day of meeting someone or whatever. Like sometimes you really just have mm-hmm. to dump it all right away. And it's it's scary. And it's yeah, I think that's I agree. That's why it's so important to feel like you can trust your director and your your other actors and rehearsal is a great way to do that, to form that bond, to form that trust. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I like what you said earlier too, about it being just like an exploration, like you said, Carolina, because I know for me, like I have a very, like I'm a Virgo, I have a very analytical mind. I like things to be organized and feel, you know, but I was finding myself for a long time, just trying to perfect scenes as an actor. And then I finally got into a class where they were like, we don't care if you've memorized this scene. We don't care if it's perfect. We literally just want you to play. Like that was kind of the point of the whole class. And it really allowed me that freedom, like, okay. And then you find a lot of times something that you didn't even think of that'll come out of that, you know, when you get to explore and play. So yeah. I think think that's that's honestly one of the hardest challenges of being an actor is just removing yourself from that result oriented thinking because I mean, yep. on set, like so much of it is to get get the shot, get the feeling, get the tear, get the whatever. And and like for me, all of the interesting performances that I really admire are, are like so present and they're not about achieving anything. They're just about like really being inside of the present moment and working really intuitively. Yeah. But it's so hard. It's our greatest challenge. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> well, yeah, especially like then you layer on the pandemic, the like the st- natural external stressors that are occurring in our day-to-day lives, <laughs> how much caffeine we've had. <laughs> like, it's like all of that, you have to like go to set and be like, okay, fuck all that yeah. noise. We're here. We need to like just, and honestly though, I found when I can do that, it's the most freeing experience of why I love acting so much in that sense it's just like okay I can actually just tell everything to fuck off because I have to like connect which is easier said than done but that is just uh, the joy (laughs) I love kids so much because when you like watch kids play or watch kids interact with each other they're just like so present following impulse they're like touch Mm -hmm. smell feel grab punch like they're just like following yeah. every single impulse as it's happening and it's so pure yeah. and I love watching it. I was just like yeah yeah that's what we're <laughs> doing all the time <laughs> so true I just started nannying just uh to to make ends meet over here as we do <laughs> and that has been so fun like uh, the little one that I, I nanny she's such like a performer she's really into into the woods right now and is like acting out and she like really is excited about the witch noise like she can growl like the witch and I'm like this is amazing just to see her like yeah like dive into her own world little world and I think that's what's been the most fun part of that job has been like observing like kids and remembering that we have to do that in a weird way (laughs) like we're now these adults and and it's with all these responsibilities but we have to like tap into that childlike play and 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 fantasy and I think I I don't know how much people can understand that process (laughs) it's so weird (laughs) is there something you do best like a tip or something to kind of help free your space or like your mind that you could give oh yeah I mean I do lots of exercises to kind of clear out negative thinking and like result oriented thinking there's um one that I do, it's maybe like a little intricate, whatever you asked me. So I'm going to tell you the answer. Yeah. Um, yes. Sometimes when I find I'm really in my head or I'm thinking a lot of like mm-hmm. negative thoughts or result oriented thoughts, I'll do this exercise yeah. where you isolate kind of the five ego states in your, in your head. So you have the positive child, which is the the part of you that's like, I can't wait to go to work. I love working. It's the it's the it's the the ego state that you bring to your work, right? And then you have the positive parent, which is like, you're doing great. This is a great interview. You're gonna make it through. And then you write all those thoughts down. And then you write down your negative child, which is like your tantrum self. I don't want to be here. I'm tired. I don't want to do this. 
And then you also write down your negative parent, which is like, you're not good enough. You don't deserve this. And then you address those negative thoughts with your adult voice, which is basically your rational thinking self, the fact-based detachment state. Mm -hmm. So often, sometimes before I'm going to go to work, if I'm feeling like I have imposter syndrome or I'm feeling like nervous, I'll like take like an hour, I'll write down all those voices, I'll see what's going on specifically in my negative thinking and I'll address those negative thoughts from a very kind of rational place. It's like, honestly, it's pretty much a cognitive behavioral therapy exercise, but I find it really helpful to kind of like washing out that like negative thinking that might be stopping you from really being present in your work. Yeah, I love that. I mean, it's such a, it is like a mind trick, you know, to, to separate yourself. I mean, it's like when people have anxiety and it's, you know, like name five things you can see, four things you can smell and like that whole process, like yeah. really just kind of getting out of your head. Um, I really like that. I, I want to remember that yeah. and use that. <laughs> I think the sets are yeah. so intense and like, yeah. I think people don't realize that they're, they're very stop start. A lot of people is around, are around, they're not always quiet. And so I'll do like just simple, like mindfulness things, like where you're just noticing like a man lit a cigarette, a woman is talking loudly, someone is touching my face, I'm looking at the screen, you know, like what, like just mm -hmm. noting mentally, yeah. just like that kind of mindfulness activity right before scenes so that I'm not thinking about anything outside of what immediately is going on. Yeah, that's very smart. Yeah. I mean, that's something that I, I think people who haven't done film you know whether they've just done live theater or haven't barely started their acting career at all like don't realize that I mean when I came to LA I knew it was a start stop kind of process I know it's not always filmed in order like those are things I knew but I didn't realize how just distracting a set is and how hard it is to stay centered as an actor so yeah <laughs> it's also a good way of like just you know submitting to the environment that you're in as opposed to like shushing people or trying to control it it's like yeah, well you know that person's talking very loudly that person is doing that it's just <laughs> it inside of your environment without judging it necessarily because you can't always control the environment that you're in yeah ah oh, girl we talk about control a lot on this podcast because <laughs> control freaks <laughs> over here and I think it's in the essence of what I like to write about too. And it's just, you, that's something I've been like working on with myself is like, you can only control what you can control. And so like, you have to like, let your emotions not be triggered by the things you can't control. And something you just, when you said about using the adult voice, I've heard this advice is almost like, speak to yourself in a third person. Have you heard this before where you kind of like, it also kind of detaches yourself from Absolutely. yourself and, and again works. Yeah. And then works down. So I thought that was so interesting. You said that because I've heard it before and it's still kind of weird. Like how do you talk to yourself yeah. in like this third person way? But I think it, it totally, again, gets you to calm down and get yourself outside yourself. So like, I love all these tricks of like, and tips of observing your surroundings, talking yourself outside of yourself and like just getting, getting yourself recentered because it's it's a lot of like you all were just saying a lot of external things happening yeah. at once that you and can't I find do it's also about. a good way to be able to like let go of emotion when you're inside mm -hmm. of something that's really intense as well is that yeah. you know I think when I was a younger actor I used to think like oh if I am playing something tra traumatizing or intense like I have to live inside of that feeling all day and now no, yeah. like through the work that I do now, it's like, I can just really just like drop in and breathe and emotion can kind of flow inside of me easily. And it can also flow away from me just as easily as well. Tessa, I'm seriously digging Jambox. The fam needs to hear about their extensive music and sound effect library. I agree. Not only do they have a huge library created by Hollywood level composers, but you can search through it all based on criteria like genre and mood. Plus, they even have detailed stems you can use to create your own soundtracks from the elements they provide. You can literally be your own composer. 6,000 unique tracks and tens of thousands of stems. 
plus over 10,000 sound effects. Carolina, that's amazing. Oh, it gets better. They even gave us a discount code for our listeners. 10% off with Fem10. Connecting filmmakers with ridiculously good music and sound effects. Go and visit jambox.io and start leveling up your sound production. Exactly. Again, that's code FEM, F-E-M-M-E, 10 at jambox.io. Yeah, that's important. Yeah, I wanted to touch on that because your characters, if you can in your own words, or I can if you'd <laughs> like, um, explain to our audience just the, the synopsis because your character is going through something where I was curious, how did you like live in that and not like also be very depressed the whole time, just putting it blankly. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, I can try and do a synopsis. I'm not, I'm not very good at this, but uh, okay. So. It's uh, I, I got you. I got you. So we, we touched on all my puny sorrows is based on the novel um, by Marin Tows. And it's, it's about a story of two loving sisters, one gifted pianist played by Sarah um, known as Elf, the character obsessed with ending her life, the other is struggling is a struggling writer played by Allison Pill, who is wrestling with this decision to make a profound um, who is wrestling with this decision and makes a profound discovery about herself. So Sarah's character, again, just struggling with with wanting to end her life and that I just can't even imagine having to go th- into that emotion constantly. So that's why I'm asking you Sarah right now like how do you how did you do that well I was I've been a really big fan of Miriam's writing for a long time and I loved this novel I was so moved by this novel when I first read it yeah um because it explores intergenerational trauma depression suicide in in a way that I had never really thought about before um so when I was offered the part I was really excited because it's such an incredible, you know, it's such an incredible novel and the film, the adaptation was really great. And then after I signed on, I was kind of, I kind of freaked out and I had this, this like really serious imposter syndrome because, you know, I'm, I definitely have, you know, dealt with depression. I have dealt with depression in my family, um, but I haven't dealt with suicide and I'm not, I'm, I'm, really pretty help a pretty happy and so I felt immediately like I didn't really have the right to step into the character and I felt afraid that I would portray someone I wouldn't portray an accurate depiction of what this character Mm -hmm. was going through and then there's the added layer that it's based on Miriam's life and the character Elf is based on her real life sister who's no longer with us so then I felt Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, I felt this that tremendous was... responsibility to portray her sister in a way that was authentic. Um, yeah. So Miriam and I, we live in the same city and I, I reached out to her uh, before I went up north to shoot the film. And I wasn't really sure, you know, what I was going to get. I've done a lot of adaptations before and writers, when you meet them, especially novelists, they either have a persona or they're deflective or they're not really as vulnerable as they're writing. But Miriam Mm. was incredible. She was so open with me. We talked for hours. We talked about her sister and her father and their, you know, relationships growing up and growing up inside of a Mennonite community and, and what her sister was like. And I think for me, the biggest takeaway was that you know, yes, her sister was struggling with depression and she was also very passionate about ending her life, but she was also funny and smart and creative and good at hiding her depression and so many other things. And, and so when I, I, I left that meeting feeling very empowered because I felt like a lot of my instincts about this character were being validated I went Mm -hmm. up to North Bay and started working with Mike and Allison, something that I really, you know, advocated for as an actor was to be able to play a character that was also allowed to be more than just what you would think as stereotypically depressed and tired and on a couch and not, you know, 
having low energy. It's right. like she can be so many other things because she was. That's what was heartbreaking to watch. Yeah. Yeah. Like, because you saw this character who still had the spunk of life in her, you know, and you're like, with, yeah, the witty. But at the like, same time, you know, like real disassociation from life. Yeah. And this mm-hmm. real kind of inability to like actually authentically derive joy from it. And so, yeah, so I've, I felt like it was really, really a key piece having Miriam um, there to actually speak to about it because she was kind of like the source. Yeah. Um, and that was a real gift as an actor, I think, you know, playing a role like this. But I think going back to your question, I, I am a, I am an introvert. And when I work, I don't really socialize. Like I really need the downtime because I find being around people really draining. Mm -hmm. And so like, I usually like eat lunch in my trailer by myself. And so COVID has been great for me because it's like (laughs) no socializing, everyone is like off. And then I rented this cabin that was 40 minutes outside of the town we were shooting in, like in the middle of the woods on this frozen lake and I was just like by myself and it was it was really great because again you know as I said 2020 was such an intense year and such a year of loss it really felt like good to kind of just get away from it all and be with myself yeah yeah what I I but I felt the same way <laughs> so, I'm like okay we get to like center in on ourselves mm-hmm. for once and it's not selfish like we're forced to to look in words and I really appreciated that but it was also really yeah. hard <laughs> with everything else going on so but that's but breaking it down like yeah that's definitely I think giving yourself permission to step into your own choices and your own thoughts about what someone who is suicidal looks like I think that is so challenging but I'm really glad like you're yeah you were able to figure that out with Miriam's help and and find I guess the I I the, I just find both sides and not judge the character mm-hmm. if that makes sense because it's so easy to do that even if you personally don't can't align with how that person's thinking I just can't imagine how to work around that um because of how your character really feels and seeing Allison's pills character feel so strongly like why do you have to do this you know you're making all of us all everyone else like suffer if that makes yeah. sense so I felt like that was what was really hard to watch in the film was like oh like <laughs> and but have empathy for you and your character and know like she's suffering so I I I don't know if you had a, a stance of how you had to detach your personal ties or you as an actor. I mean, we're ch- told to not judge characters. So I kind of wanted to talk about your mental like block there, if that makes sense, or I'm just rambling. <laughs> well, I think I've definitely been on both sides of it in the sense that, you know, yeah. if you are living with or have experience with someone who is going through depression, it's kind of maddening to be on the other side of it. Mm. So not mm-hmm. under handing yeah. it and I think in so many ways that's what makes it kind of tragic is that we don't really have any idea of somebody's mental state and we often don't have compassion for it um, because we're on the other side being like hey you know what you know come over here it's so much better on this yeah. side yeah um, and then I think you know with Elf in the novel Miriam does such a great job of opening up that gray space through Mm-hmm. humor and then also through the exploration of family and familial love you know and to what it is to really love somebody to give them space to have what they truly want and for elf that's to end her life and end her suffering and i yeah. think obviously as an actor it, i have to have empathy for that character in order to really embody right. that person so I, I hope that when people watch the movie, we so often think about suicide or assisted suicide or depression in very black and white terms. Mm-hmm. The truth is, is that like all conditions of humanity, it's not black and white. There's a lot of gray and there's a lot of questions that 
can't be answered definitively. Uh, and I hope that when you watch the film, you come away having allowed yourself the space to think within that realm. And, and for me, that's, that's why we watch films. That's why we digest. Work. That's why we make space for that in our culture is because it questions dominant ideology and it makes you think. Yeah. Yes, 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 yes to all of that. And I, I definitely felt like um, watching the film, that's exactly, thank you for more eloquently explaining that, but it had that, that you can see both sides so well and how it isn't just this easy decision or area of like resolving mm -hmm. someone who's going through something like that. You can't just, it's not a switch It in and therapy is an important part of it, but it doesn't always like just answer all the questions that someone's going through. Um, and to really, understand I find that. as an actor, yeah. those are the interesting situations to like, to be in is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. like just if you like, if you truly love someone, you know, to what extent does your love allow you to set them free? Or like, if you, yeah. you, you know, if you are truly unhappy, you know, to what extent would you go to relieve yourself of that unhappiness? It's just like those questions, those open-ended questions are like the, the things yeah. that you are, you want to explore uh, mm -hmm. as an actor. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think if our listeners aren't already convinced to watch this film, like it's, it's just, there's so much, so many layers and so much to it and so much yeah. emotion, you know? Um, so I would love if you could share with our listeners, um, where they will be able to watch the film or at least watch the trailer and as well as any of your own personal, you know, social media, anything like that, where they can keep up with what you're doing. Um, so you can see all my puny sorrows on demand and digitally um, after May 3rd. And if you have any questions about the film or want to keep up to date, you can always follow me on Instagram at Sarah Gadden. Love it. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much, well, Sarah. This was this was yeah. so fun to delve into. We don't always get these like um, we have a lot of directors and producers, but we always have a special place for our actors. So we're we come from acting first, and we also know you've directed and you know done more than one thing as well in the realm of independent film. So thank you again for just like giving us this this wonderful digestible like conversation oh, it was it's such a pleasure just... to talk to you both Your <laughs> so great and it was so nice to be able to like get you know beneath the surface and really talk about about yeah. this film thank you so much for having me on and for taking the time to talk to me i really appreciate it thanks for listening to fem regard podcast if you like what you hear tune in every friday for more tips on the filmmaking business and insightful conversations with industry professionals we can only grow with your support, so please subscribe, share, rate, and review. You can also join the Fem Fam on Patreon. For more on us, check us out at femregard.com. You're listening to the Geekscape Network. 